and welcome to this month's What's Happening in Our Community. I'm your host, Karen Cox, the broker of record at CNSKI Realty, and I'm here today with the Director of Education, Lori Wilder, for the Blue Water District School Board. And today, we are going to be talking about the return to school in September and what's happening moving forward. So, Lori, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Karen. It's so nice to be invited. Thank you very much. And it's, it's wonderful seeing you again. Yes, it's so great to see you. Um, these are interesting times. The way the students and the staff um, left the school in the spring and what, how school is going to be when they return in September, it's going to be a little different, I think, um, especially due to COVID. And so I think everyone's sort of interested to see to hear from you how it's going to be when we return to school and what sort of model uh, Blue Water D District School Board is going to be going with. So I'm looking forward to this chat, Lori, and hearing more about school come September. Yes, thank you. I, I too am looking forward to the chat, Karen. And uh, Blue Water District School Board is uh, going to begin the 2021 20, school year following a conventional full return model, which is a regular return. The Ministry of Education designated us. Um, we are not a designated board. So that means that the students can return for in-person delivery of teaching and instruction five days a week. Uh, so for that, we're, we're very thankful for. Uh, participation, though, in face-to-face -face learning at school is optional for families. So parents and guardians do have the option to uh, go for remote learning or online learning for their children and they can indicate their preference for that uh, with a pre-registration survey that we sent out. So have you been hearing questions from parents about that survey and what school's going to look like because they've got an option from what you're saying they can go back to the new normal which is the conventional way of going to school five days a week in the classroom or they can do remote online learning. So are you hearing from parents which way they're preferring? So we're just in the process now, Karen, of uh, collecting that data. Our um, closing date for the survey is actually tomorrow. So parents were required to complete the survey, whether they were sending their children back to school or not, because we just wanted to get a, a real good sense of our numbers. For those that were choosing to keep their children home at the beginning of the school year, they had to fill out a following, a further survey where they could indicate their preference for online learning. So we don't have the survey results to share at this time, but our staff will be compiling the data and working with the schools as we prepare for the reopening. So if I had a, a child that was an elementary student, how is that going to look different than going back to high school? Is there differences between elementary school and I guess I'd say high school for a student returning? Uh, there are some slight differences, but because we are deemed to be a non-designated board and the reason we received the non-designation is because our cases of COVID in Graham Bruce counties has been quite low. Transmission rates is are low. And so that is why we got this uh, non-designation. So for elementary students, they will be divided into cohorts. So grades eight, or kindergarten to grade eight cohorts will be uh, just students in their own classroom or their own homeroom. And interaction with other classes and teachers will be limited. Teachers who support class instruction and provide teacher preparation time, for example, French teachers or phys ed teachers, music teachers, will move between classrooms rather than students rotating through rooms. And students will then have designated times and areas of the playground they can access. For secondary, our schedule for secondary will be divided into uh, what is called quadmesters, uh, so that students are connected to only two groups of students per quadmester. And that is to keep the direct and indirect direct student contacts low. So in Blue Water District School Board, our format is going to be period one course on day one and period two course on day two, and then repeating. And for elementary or secondary students who access a special education unit of sorts, they will remain with their cohort 
uh, in a self-contained classroom for the day. In secondary though, they also could have an option of being integrated into one or two courses if, um, if they're, uh, that's part of their programming. So for elementary school children, uh, they are gonna be at the same desk all day, right? They're gonna be assigned a desk at the beginning of the school year and that's their desk for the year. Um, and if you're saying the teachers are the ones rotating, not the students. So that, that makes it very health and safety because the kids don't have to move. I like that. So when you're saying for high school, what I'm hearing is that you're taking one class subject for the whole day. That's correct. So they will be. So history on Monday, let's say math on Tuesday, geography on Wednesday, that sort of thing. So you're taking that one subject for the whole day. Yes, but actually, because we're um, it's a quad master, we're only offering two courses for the first bit so that will be from September till middle of November so they will actually only be rotating between two courses for example um, a math and an English they would have math on Monday English on Tuesday and then repeat that until November then they would do their exams in those two um, courses or their final assessments and then they would begin two new courses uh, middle of November until end of January. And then that would get them their four courses for first semester. And then we'd be done their first semester. Interesting, okay. Because I know when I was in high school, there was four subjects for the semester. So you're, you split the semester into half and you got two subjects for the first half of the semester and you're totally completed those two subjects, and then the last half of the semester, you take two new subjects and you complete those. So it's yes. a concentration of course material in a half a semester. Okay, so that will be good for a lot of students because they only have two courses to concentrate on. Absolutely, it's very much uh, like a summer school model in a way, although in summer school they are only focusing on one course. But I think for a lot of students, you're absolutely right, Karen, it's an opportunity for them to focus only on the two courses for a shorter period of time uh, with the support of the teachers all along the way. And of course, we will incorporate breaks into the day and uh, lunch hour into the day. So they will have times that they um, can relax a bit before they get back and focus in the classroom. So, what is lunch hour going to look like? Is it going to be staggered? Is it in the classroom? Um, are they going to be able to go outside for lunch? What sort of plans has Blue Water made for the lunch time for students? So our nutrition breaks and lunch schedules and routines will be developed by each school to ensure that the chances for contact and transmission are minimized. So elementary students are asked to bring a litterless lunch if possible, and this will allow them to take their containers home for cleaning each day, and they will be eating in their classrooms for the most part. Uh, for secondary, um, our cafeterias will not be open as of September uh, 8th when we open, but uh, the companies are looking at coming back to offer cafeteria services. So we are working with them to determine the services that they will be able to provide. So our principals, our administrators, are all back um, next on August 24th. So they are back and they will be looking at their own school schedules and developing those routines for lunches and nutrition breaks. So we've talked about coming back to the school. Um, because we live in a large rural area here in Grey Bruce, are we looking at for the buses that we're gonna have assigned seats on the bus and wearing a mask on the bus? Like what are, what are gonna be the protocols and sort of safety rules put into place for the students that commute by bus to get to the school? Uh, health and safety, of course, is uh, our priority. So having said that, we will be looking at uh, assigned seating on the bus. We will be looking to uh, ensure that families, members sit together on the bus and also masking will be required on the bus uh, for the students. So the Ministry of Education in their guidance document has said that students in grades four and up, it's mandatory that they mask and that students kindergarten to three um, do not necessarily have to, 
but we are going to encourage students as well in K-3 to three to mask, uh, exceptions for those with a medical condition, of course. So uh, we would be doing the same on busing, uh, on the buses. As well, we will be, um, of course, daily uh, uh, hygiene and cleaning of our buses uh, would be required as well. So that sounds good. So you've got an assigned seat and you could have a, a seat mate, depending if it's on your family, or maybe if it's somebody that's in your class that's on the same route because you're already co-acting with them or they're sort of in your school bubble. Um, I can sort of see that. So that's good. And so when they get to the school, then is there a procedure to enter the school when they get there? Uh, for sure, again, when our principals are back, they're going to be looking at that. So they will be looking at uh, staggered entry and exit of students uh, coming in and out of the school and uh, one-way routes in the hallways. We will also be looking at regular daily cleaning of frequently touched surfaces and signs posted on all entrances used by students and staff floor decals outside the washrooms. We will have enhanced hand hygiene requirements for students during the school day. And we'll also be providing uh, curricular lessons for students on proper hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. Uh, and hand sanitizer will be at all entry points in classrooms and meeting spaces and in other areas. Uh, something else, our classroom desks will be spaced uh, appropriately and facing forward and as well, we're encouraging outdoor lessons uh, when the weather permits, because all studies show that being outside uh, is a, provides a really healthy environment. That is something I would have enjoyed in the fall, going to school and having outdoor classes. So that sounds wonderful, really, because <laughs> I know the schools can get quite hot in the spring and the fall. So that sounds wonderful to be outside in the fresh air. So. <laughs> It sounds like, you know, the school board has been giving us a lot of thought and probably more thought than a lot of, you know, parents even understand, you know, because I know you've got the utmost safety and health of all the students in your staff. And I know you haven't mentioned it yet, but I believe the staff have to wear masks and the face shields too, right, at the schools when they're there? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I did hear the staff for sure have to wear the mask. I didn't hear the other one that you'd mentioned, Karen. Oh, that they would also have to wear the face shields. Oh, um, masking is uh, required. Face shields only required perhaps for um, staff that may uh, require them for the work that they're doing. Um, but face shields for all teachers uh, isn't required is not required because we're in a lower incidence of COVID up here in Grey Bridge. Right. Okay. Because right. I know some schools are saying that all the teachers and all the staff have to wear masks and face shields. Okay. And I can definitely see that in some of the special education classes because you have closer contact in those classrooms. Yes. And so for totally uh, correct. So for staff in those situations, they are certainly, we would be providing face shields for them and gowns and gloves if required. Wow. Okay. So phys ed, is there going to be gym coming in the fall? Is it going to be outdoors? <laughs> is it going to be sort of like a single sport or is that going to be more like yoga? Well, and you know that phys ed is near and dear to my heart as a former physical and health education teacher. Uh, so phys ed classes will still occur. Uh, we are encouraging them to go outside as much as possible. I would also say that we're encouraging uh, activities that do not involve a lot of equipment because with equipment becomes the more high touch areas. So we would encourage um, activities that are uh, low organizational games of type and, and games that are uh, no contact games, of course, so that would allow students to distance if possible. Which is great because you can have an outdoor break, you can go for a walk or they could go cross country running or they could, do all sorts of different activities that are, have got the physical spacing that you need and not the physical contact that they could be playing outdoors. So. Exactly. I know um, our local OFSA association, so our Ontario Federation for Athletic and Sports, they have actually cancelled their uh, fall sports season 
So this is for our competitive sports. Uh, when uh, students join teams to play, for example, basketball, volleyball, um, football, things like that. So we have received notice that OFSA has canceled all of the fall sports. Uh, we are doing the same in terms of those um, teams. We will not be running teams, but we will certainly be encouraging in our um, phys ed classes, uh, lots of activity. Which is good. In music class, you indicated that the music teacher may be going from classroom to classroom instead of the students moving to the music room in elementary yes. schools, correct? We do want to keep the movement of students uh, to a minimum. Uh, so music itself uh, provides some interesting dimensions uh, when it comes to instruments or when it comes to singing. The ministry guidance document was saying that singing is not a recommended activity. Uh, so we have actually posted on our website um, a Q&A for parents, which outlines um, all of a lot of what we're talking about today. So we have two sections. We have a school operation sections and a program section, program and instruction section. And it's a living document because we're continually revising and changing based on ministry announcements and changing and just some of the new details that emerge in our planning. But it does highlight a lot of those specifics in terms of uh, what we're looking at for different courses as well. And we've had ongoing communication over the summer as well and uh, with the Ministry of Education and other school boards, uh, community partners, local public health, as I uh, previously mentioned, and our union leaders. And we've been doing our best to keep our parents and guardians up to date uh, on our planning by sending out centralized messages using our school messenger communication platform, our board website, social media pages like Facebook and Twitter and the local media. Because as you know, parents, and our staff uh, are very much curious about what it's going to look like. And we're just doing our best to reassure folks that we're doing all that we can in terms of the health and safety aspects so that people feel really safe about returning. And I know that's the most important thing is to keep everyone, you know, healthy and safe and for the students and for the staff. Uh, and it sounds like you've been giving us a lot of thought, a lot of consultation with all the different partners, partners you've just discussed. I'm just sort of looking at, it's going to be an interesting way to go to school, but I think for the parents, we are the role models for our children. So if we embrace this change and understand that we have to change in these times during COVID, then our positive outlook on this will be, I guess, influence the students coming back to school. And that's going to be an important thing to probably get the message out there also. Karen, you are absolutely right. Uh, I did myself see something on a social media post saying exactly what you've described, that our optimism and our support of getting everybody back can be very helpful as, um, well, as parents, if they can portray that to their children. We did conduct uh, a return to school survey earlier this summer. Uh, and we did find that most of the concerns were around health and safety. We had over 7,000 7, respondents. Wow. And um, I know we were thrilled with that. So we, we can really appreciate the anxiousness uh, the parents are feeling. And uh, things the emerging things that did come out included cleaning protocols and the, the um, requirement for physical distancing, movement within the schools, which I've described for you, outdoor uh, playtime, uh, personal protective equipment, the hand hygiene, things like that. So we were very thoughtful, or, or thankful, I'm sorry, for the thoughtful feedback and perspectives that were shared. And uh, in response to, we do have on our website uh, a, an opportunity for parents who have any questions uh, related to the return to school. They can just go onto our website and there's a link that they can click and that will get them, they can upload any of their questions and we will get back to them as soon as possible with responses. So we have been fielding a lot of questions and most of them again are uh, parents concerned around their children's health and safety. So we're just doing our best to reassure them that we have uh, done all that we feel we need to consider and we'll continue to do anything else that we need to consider based on ministry direction and that of our local public health. Yes, and I, I think you need, it's a partnership between the parents and 
your staff, right? Um, that they've got to work together through this because this is new times, new a new era of education. And it, I think if the parents can embrace it and have a positive outlook, then their children will have a positive outlook. And the parents have to reinforce all the safety protocols about masks and hand washing, etc. So it, it's got to be a team working together because it's got to be reinforced on both ends. I think for it to be successful. Absolutely, and for those that aren't feeling comfortable, they do have the option for the online learning. Uh, so they can try that out and maybe give it get a sense to see how things are going and they might feel better in the future and then opt to have their children come back to school. Uh, for us in the secondary model, uh, if they choose online learning for that first uh, uh part of the quadmester, so from September to November. If they opt into the online learning, we are saying that they cannot return back face-to-face -face until the next, uh, when we offer period three and four. Because online learning is going to look different and they will not uh, be attached to the teacher that's teaching the courses in the school. So uh, we need them to make that decision. Elementary is different for us. If an elementary uh, family decides that uh, they didn't want to come back in September, but they think maybe October they would like to, they can just let their school know. And we would say within a week's time um, at the maximum, we would have them back in the classroom. So what is online education going to look like for students in Gravers? Well, it looks... Um, it, it is different than it was in the spring. So in the spring, uh, the, the Minister of Education had said that the mark that the students had as of March 13th was a mark that stayed. So we did find that the level of engagement um, from that date till the end of the school year uh, did decrease over time. So we now uh, know that the online learning is going to be more thorough. Uh, it would be al almost like a regular school day where students would be expected to engage with, as I had already referenced, not necessarily, it wouldn't be their teacher if they were there at the classroom. It would be another teacher who would be assigned to them. And uh, the government talks a lot about in the full remote learning that it would be far more structured than it was in the spring and it's a focus on synchronous instruction. That's a term that they use synchronous, which it really means as much live learning as possible. So that the student has to be online, engaged and very present. And um, they, they could, a virtual classroom uh, could be that they're with other students across the district in similar grades and attached to a teacher who will deliver that instruction. So it could at times involve students working independently and or small groups while engaged in a virtual classroom with a teacher overseeing their learning and being available for questions. So what I'm hearing is the student would be at home, but they would be in a virtual classroom on their laptop or computer, and they would be there from like nine till 3.30, let's say, with breaks for lunch and nutrition breaks, but they would be there online in a virtual classroom. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, yes, that's correct. And actually, the um, the, the ministry did release the, a guidance document, and in that, um, and, and um, um, another document, they talked about the minimum synchronous learning time requirements. So for kindergarten, for example, the minimum that they're saying has to happen is 180 minutes. Um, and then for grades one to three, it's 225 minutes. And that's the same to grade eight. And then secondary, the, what the requirement is saying is uh, the higher of 60 minutes for each 75 minute class period or 225 minutes per day for a full course schedule. So they've been very specific on the minutes that have to be achieved, the minimum number of minutes. So it's a long time on a computer. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm hearing. Um, so that, that's interesting because if you think it's going to be easier to do it at home, um, it may not be. 
It, you, it's going to be exactly. the same time requirements whether you're in the conventional classroom or you're at home on a, in a virtual classroom. That's right. That's right. It, it would be a lot of sitting, I expect. Right. Whether you're sitting at home or in a classroom. Well, that's true too. That's and I'm I know that on the online learning too, the teacher who would be uh, supporting that classroom would also allow for breaks. Right, and for lunch breaks and things like that. Yes. So yes. For the students and staff going back to school, is there any testing that has to be done before they can return on September 8th or is it temperature checks or anything like that going to happen? I know we're in a, a region where we have less cases of COVID, so I know our protocols are somewhat different, I think, but I'm not sure about that one. So all students and staff and uh, only essential visitors would be allowed into the school, so they must complete a COVID-19 uh, screening questionnaire daily before going to school. Um, so anyone with any of a, the COVID-19 symptoms as identified in the questionnaire is to remain at home until they are symptom free and or have a negative COVID-19 test result. And they are advised to see a medical professional and go to an assessment center to be tested. So we are uh, operating on the premise that our expectation is that uh, families are doing this with their children and that staff are doing that before they come to the school on a daily basis. Okay, so they don't have to go get a COVID test to go back to school September 8th. That was one of the questions I thought you might receive from parents. Uh, that is correct. That is, uh, there is no expectation in that regard to have an actual test. Okay. So. There's a lot of talk that we could have a second wave of this pandemic. I know we've been very fortunate up here in Grey Bruce, but has there been any sort of thoughts or plans made that if we do get a second wave, whether the schools, how are you going to handle education if that happens? So there is always that potential. And so early on, we were directed by the ministry to have three plans in place. One was um, the conventional return, which we are um, entering. One was an adapted plan, and that adapted plan was part online learning, part face-to-face. -face. And the third one was a, a straight online learning plan. So with those plans, should we be required at any time to switch to a different method of learning? We are prepared because we have those plans in place. Should there be a surge in COVID-19 cases, in Ontario or in this area, we must be prepared for these different models of deliver delivery and just the flexibility to switch between them. And we are prepared to do that. Wow. I know a lot of work has gone into this, Laurie. I can hear I can hear all the background work that's had to go in to get ready for September 8th. And I know the work is only halfway probably. You're still, you're gonna be, it's a living document as you say, this is gonna be a living situation that it's going to be changing as it goes to make things more safe for the students and the staff. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to add that we haven't talked about yet or like to mention to everyone? I'm just uh, very uh, pleased with this opportunity, Karen. Thank you so much for reaching out. And uh, if I can reiterate again, just the fact that we are making every effort to provide a safe and supportive environment for our students and staff to learn and work. We welcome people back to our schools. We hope that they choose to come. Uh, we honor their, re, their decisions around opting for online learning if that's what they choose to do. Uh, but uh, if they then choose to come back, we welcome them back uh, under certain parameters of timing. But Thank you very much for this opportunity, and it's great uh, seeing you again, Karen. Thank you. Well, thank you. It, this has been great, Laurie. It's been really interesting and informative to learn on what's going to happen um, going back to school in our community, and I know that's part of what's happening. You know, this is a day-to-day -day living situation, and so thank you for you taking the time to talk with us today. You're most welcome. Have a wonderful day, and uh, we'll connect again soon, I hope. That's it for today. I'd like to invite you to tell us what sort of topics you'd like to hear about and what guests you'd like to see on the next What's Happening episode next month. 
You can contact us on any of our social media accounts, as well as you can email us at info at cnskirealty.ca. We're also very excited to share that you can enjoy this content everywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Episodes can be viewed on all of our social media accounts. You can also visit cnskirealty.ca slash what's happening where you can watch all of our episodes or subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with our new episodes. And our next episode will air on Wednesday, September 30th. So stay tuned to see what's happening in our community. So thank you for tuning in today and we'll talk to you soon.